All right, let's go ahead and start. Thank you so much for being here tonight for our, our last event of our, our fall 2023 Literary Arts Lab. I want to again thank all of our esteemed guests, our uh, Chang Ray Lee, Jeffrey Yang, Daisy Hernandez, and Antoine Wilson, who've been so generous. They've been so generous and surprising and, and wise in what they've offered uh, in all our events and especially our, to our students. We've said this, we've thanked them already, but I, I think it, it bears repeating. Uh, I want to thank again our superstars, uh, Starsha Gill, our events coordinator. <laughs> then, uh, also Denise Dooley, our, our student uh, affairs coordinator. Um, and, and also our events committee, Suzanne Buffum, Rachel Dwoskin, and Nick Twimlow. Uh, tremendous work in the planning and implementing of all this. Thank you so much. So I'm really thrilled to finally have Antoine Wilson here at UChicago. Uh, he's an old friend whose writing I've followed and admired for, God, over 15 years now. Uh, Interloper came out, what, like 2007? Right? Antoine was born in Montreal and raised in California uh, and Saudi Arabia. I didn't know that. Yeah, just one year. Wow. Seventh, um, grade. seventh grade? Seventh grade. Wow. And now lives with his family in Los Angeles where his wife is uh, also a writer, a screenwriter. And by the way, I didn't know this, her father wrote uh, on Murder, She Wrote in Colombo? Created. Created. Yeah. That kind of blew my mind. Uh, that's my childhood right there. And he got his MFA at the Iowa Writers Workshop, where we first met, and was also a fellow at the prestigious uh, Wisconsin Institute for Creative Writing. He's taught at many different schools, including UCLA and Stanford, and has also been a long time <laughs> Stanford. Uh, and has also been a longtime contributing editor at the literary magazine of Public Space, which is a fantastic magazine. Um, he's the author of three novels, The Interloper, uh, Panorama City, and most recently, Mouth to Mouth, which was a finalist for the California Independent Booksellers Award and long listed for Canada's uh, biggest literary award, the Scotiabank Giller Prize, and was also listed on our biggest literary award, uh, Barack Obama's 2022 summer reading list. What I think has always been striking about his work, Antoine's work, is, is his gift for profoundly intriguing uh, uh, premises and for making each page uh, profoundly readable. Now, this is an obvious thing to say, but it's very, very hard to keep the reader turning the page, uh, as every writer knows. Um, Antoine does this first and foremost with his meticulous sense of craft Every single word is perfectly chosen and arranged uh, for everything they obviously mean, uh, but also for everything they might suggest or meaningfully obscure. He often uses the tools of genre fiction, particularly the elements of, of thriller and, and crime novels, uh, not in their uh, abject or contrived forms, but as a, a subversive vehicle for the thorniest questions uh, about the human condition. Um, in Mouth to Mouth, our middle-aged narrator, a somewhat famous, somewhat nobody writer, is at the JFK airport and bumps into an old college friend, a somewhat friend. And during a long flight delay, this somewhat friend says he has a story to tell that he's never told anyone. Uh, and as they're sitting there in this, this fancy lounge at the airport, he tells the story, which begins 20 years ago, with him saving a drowning man one morning as he's surfing. He's surfing, right? No, he's just sitting on the beach. He's just sitting on the beach, okay. I just <laughs> conflate him with you because Antoine's a surfer. Um, and this somewhat college friend is severely traumatized. No, no, yeah, 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 Jeff. Is severely traumatized by what most would see as an act of selfless heroism. And in the wake of this, where he's left in a, a vacuum of anonymity and, and these intense, impotent emotions, he tracks down the man he saves. And from there, intentionally and unintentionally becomes absorbed into this man's life. And suddenly it's 3, 3 a.m. and you can't stop reading. And you realize, though, that as you've been reading, you've also been confronting all of these heady questions. Um, is 
all life precious and worth saving? Um, what is actually moral or selfless about her heroism? What does it mean exactly to know another human being? What does it mean to have agency in the world if you can't derive meaning from the decisions you make, or at least stable meaning? Is vengeance for the person taking vengeance? Is it always something that we plan or that we even want? These are my, at least the questions I ask. Uh, and Mouth to Mouth explores these and other, I think, ultimately unanswerable questions on its way to keeping you awake until 4 a.m. Um, and also, I forgot to mention this, set in the art world, which is fascinating for me. Anyway, I can't wait to talk to him about it, but first let's hear him read from some of it. And uh, please help me welcome again Antoine Wilson. <laughs> This is what comes with age, multiple glasses. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for having me here. Um, this has been an absolutely delightful few days, and um, I'm really grateful to have been invited to participate. I am going to read, I'm going to read the first chapter of the book, and then uh, I'll read a little, a little passage from you know, almost all the way toward the end. Um, so it'll give you a flavor for what's going on. I sat at the gate at JFK, having red-eyed my way from Los Angeles, exhausted, minding my own business, reflecting on what I'd seen the night before, shortly after takeoff, shortly before sleep, something I'd never seen from an airplane. I'd been on the left side of the plane, and we'd gone south over the ocean, accident of fate, affording me a panoramic view of the city at night. Amber streetlights dotting neighborhoods, red stripe, white stripe garlands of freeway traffic, mysterious black gaps of waterways and parkland. Then a small burst of light, not at ground level, but above it. Another burst of light, streaks opening like a flower in time-lapse. A fireworks show. I watched the little explosions until we penetrated the cloud layer. It wasn't a holiday. I was thinking about how a sight that might consume our attention completely on the ground could, from another perspective, barely register as a blip on an enormous field when I heard a name over the PA. Jeff Cook, the agent said, please check in at the counter for gate 11. A common enough name, but it piqued my attention. I had known a Jeff Cook once at UCLA, almost 20 years earlier. Looking up, I saw a handsome man in his 40s striding toward the counter. He was dressed in a sharp blue suit, no tie, glasses with transparent lucite frames, expensive leather loafers. He said his name to the gate agent and slid his boarding pass and identification across the counter. While she clicked away at the noisy keyboard, he leaned slightly on the handle of his fancy hard-shelled rollerboard suitcase. From where I sat near the gate, I could examine this Jeff Cook closely, in profile. I'd all but determined that he wasn't the Jeff Cook I'd known and was going to turn my attention elsewhere when he looked in my direction. I knew those high, broad cheekbones and that penetrating gaze. It was he. But Jeff had had famously long, dark flowing hair, not this cropped salt and pepper business. Plus, he'd put on weight, become more solid in the way so many of us did after college, continuing to grow into manhood long after we thought we'd arrived. We hadn't been friends exactly, barely acquaintances, but Jeff was one of those minor players from the past who claimed for himself an outsized role in my memories. During my freshman year, I experienced a series of encounters, if they could even be called that, in various locations on and off campus with a fellow student who had, for some reason or another, caught my attention. With his cascading hair and distinctive features, he was hard to miss, a sort of thrift store Adonis, and he carried himself with the quiet confidence of an upperclassman. We didn't cross paths so much as he would just pop up from time to time at a table in the corner of a coffee shop wandering around a protest for the first Gulf War, or, most randomly, lit up by my car's reverse lights as I backed out of a friend's driveway one night. Every sighting of this mystery man yielded a frisson, as if he were my guardian angel keeping tabs on me, 
followed by a pang of anxiety at the thought that I might never see him again. Near the end of that year, I went with a friend to buy weed from an acquaintance of his, a fellow stoner who had picked up a little extra to hook up his buddies and make a few bucks in the process. We swung by an apartment building on Gailey, an ugly multi-unit box. The shabby security vestibule opened on an elevator that stank of rancid hydraulic fluid. Upstairs, the hallway was anonymous and bland, but the apartment had a distinctive grotto-like atmosphere, the windows covered over with bed sheets, and the walls festooned with posters, all of them for the same band, a band I'd never heard of, Marillion. We stood awkwardly in the middle of the living room while a line of stoned residents deliquesced into the couch in front of us, eyes more wary than friendly. At the end of the couch, as stoned as the rest of them, sat my long-haired guardian angel. My friend got the pot, and perhaps to make the visit seem less transactional, his friend made introductions around the room. I learned the name of the mystery man, a name not nearly as mysterious as he was, Jeff. First quarter of sophomore year, there he was again, in cinema and social change. Every Tuesday and Thursday in Melnitz Hall, his myth disintegrated further the slow grind of familiarity rendering him into just another undergrad, a fellow non-film major as clueless as I was about the movies we were discussing. This process struck me as curious. Over the years, it would spring to mind whenever I found myself having to deal with people whose fame summoned in me an irrational but persistent agitation. The gate agent bent behind the counter to retrieve something from the printer. She handed Jeff his identification and boarding pass. He thanked her and turned to go. When he came past me, I said his name. He looked at me quizzically. Yes, he said. UCLA, I said. His eyebrows went up behind those lucite frames. Jesus, he said. You look exactly the same. Plus, 20 years or so, but you know what I mean. I wondered if he was trying to place me. I started to say my name, but he beat me to it. That's me, I said. Names and faces, he said, tapping his temple. It's a thing. Oh, God, I thought. He's become a salesman. <laughs> he put out his hand to shake. That film class, he said, I remember. Only one I ever took. Same. Almost failed it. Couldn't stay awake in the dark. The whole thing felt like a dream. You didn't miss much, I said. I didn't mean it, but I was making conversation. He smiled and took me in for a moment. Hey, why don't you join me in the first class lounge? I've got a, an extra pass. What about the flight? He pointed at the display above the gate. We'd been delayed. I'd already spent hours in the airport, my tickets having been purchased last minute and at the cheapest possible fare. A red eye from LA, a layover at JFK, a flight to Frankfurt, a four hour train ride to Berlin, and the idea of a first class lounge was so appealing, I could have hugged old Jeff right then and there. I trailed him through the terminal, his soft leather briefcase and fresh-looking rollerboard making me wish I'd replaced my scruffy backpack with something more adult. The terminal wasn't packed, but it was crowded enough that we made better progress single file than two abreast. His hair was cropped neatly in a line above his collar. Everything about him conveyed neatness and taste. In college, I'd never seen him in nice clothes, only ripped up jeans and weathered t-shirts worn inside out to obscure whatever was written on them. Whether this was fashion or indigence was never clear to me. The whole way from gate to lounge elevator, as I followed him and the rhythm, rhythmic tick-tock of his bag's wheels across the terminal's tiles, he didn't once look back to make sure I was following. I wondered if he was having second thoughts about inviting me into the land of the fancy people. I hope I hadn't seemed over-eager when accepting his offer. At the elevator, he was back to normal, or how he had been at the gate. Delighted at the coincidence and looking forward to catching up, though, as far as I knew, we didn't have much to catch up on. I presumed that he was one of those people who hated being alone. Perhaps if I'd been paying closer attention, or if I'd known what was to come, I'd have detected a glimmer of desperation in his eyes. I don't know. Maybe it wasn't there. Not yet. We checked into the lounge at a marble counter, where an officious young man took my pass and waved us in, letting us know that they would be announcing when it was time for us to head down to the gate. Jeff found seats by the window, a low table between them, and gestured for me to sit as if he were my host. The chair was real leather and the table real wood. He offered to grab a few beers. 
I hadn't had a drink in eight years, but said that I'd be happy to watch him drink. He made for the food area, leaving his bags. Even in the airport's privileged inner sanctum, I couldn't look at the unattended bags without imagining they contained contraband or a bomb. I put it out of my mind. My mantra for air travel has always been, stop thinking. From the moment one enters the airport, one is subject to a host of procedures and mechanisms designed to get one from point A to point B. Stop thinking and be the cargo. Jeff strolled up, two beers in hand. He put one in front of me, announcing that he'd found a non-alcoholic brew, and that he wasn't sure if I drank them, but he thought it might make things feel more ceremonial, that was the word he used, for us to catch up over a couple of beers, alcoholic or not, for old time's sake. We had never drunk together that I could remember, but I let it go. We clinked bottles and sipped, our eyes turning to the plane traffic outside. The miracle of travel, he said. Fall asleep someplace, wake up halfway around the world. I can't sleep on planes, I said. I know a woman, he said, friend of a friend, you could say, who's terrified of flying, but has to travel to various places every year for family obligations. Only flies private, by the way. This is a very wealthy person. And here's what she does. An anesthesiologist comes to her house, knocks her out in her own bed, travels with her to the airport, to wherever she's going, unconscious, and when they arrive at the destination, she's loaded into whatever bed she's staying in, whether it's one of her other homes or a hotel, and he brings her back. She literally goes to sleep in one place and wakes up in another. Someone should do that for us in economy, I said. <laughs> you could fit a lot more people on every flight, Sar sardiniously. Jeff sipped his beer. You have business in Frankfurt, he asked, his eyes passing over my scuffed sneakers. Berlin, I said, my publisher is there. I didn't mention that I was traveling on my own dime, hoping to capitalize on a German magazine's labeling me a cult author. <laughs> or, or that I was also taking a much needed break from family obligations, carving out a week from carpools and grocery shopping to live the life readers picture writers live full time. I can't imagine writing a book, he said. Neither can I. <laughs> I'd said it before and meant it every time, but people always took it as an expression of false modesty. Jeff laughed slightly. His demeanor changed, and I expected him to ask if he should have heard of any of my books. Instead, he asked if I'd ever gone under. I had my tonsils out in high school. Did you worry you wouldn't wake up? I shook my head. Didn't cross my mind, though, were I to go under now, I wouldn't be so cavalier. You have kids, too. Changes everything, doesn't it? He had undergone surgery recently. Nothing serious, or not life-threatening, at least, but he had ended up terrified that he wouldn't wake up again. It did happen to people. And though such accidents had become exceedingly rare, he couldn't help but imagine his going to sleep and never waking up, what it would do to his children. He had two as well, and to his wife. The whole episode had disturbed him greatly. Sleep is the cousin of death, I said. Outside, a jumbo jet came in for a landing, too high and too fast and too far down the runway, at least to my eyes, and maybe to Jeff's too, since he watched it as well, but it came down fine, slowed dramatically and made for the taxiway like any other plane. All the activity outside, the low vehicles buzzing around, the marshallers and wing walkers guiding planes with their orange batons, the food service trucks lifting and loading, the jetways extending, the segmented luggage carts rumbling across the tarmac. All of it vibrated under the gray sky like a Boschian tableau. While I had been watching, he had been hunting down a thought. Coming out of surgery, he said, waking up in the recovery room, foggy as hell, I didn't feel the sense of relief I'd expected to feel. That only came later when I saw my family again. I felt like I'd lost a chunk of time. Like sleep, but when you sleep, you wake up where you went down. I felt that things had happened to me without my knowledge, which they had, of course, and I was left with the uncanny sense that I wasn't the same person who had gone under. Time had passed. A part of my body was no longer in me. I had had a square shaved from my leg for some kind of circuit-completing electrode, but I was still I, obviously. Now, this may have been a side effect of the drugs, but I couldn't shake the feeling that I'd only just arrived in the world. 
as a replacement for the old me. It wore off, as I said, but it wasn't a pleasant state. Like a near-death experience, I asked. Funny you should say that, Jeff said, as if he hadn't just nudged the conversation in that direction. I ended up in close proximity to one once, not long after college. In fact, a year or so later. I was, through no planning or forethought on my part, responsible for saving a man's life. I wondered why he emphasized no planning or forethought when that would have been the default. <laughs> what happened, I asked. Let me grab a few more beers first. No, no, I said, these are on me. They're free. <laughs> let, me, let me get them then. He settled into his chair. I rose and made my way past a variety of travelers from business types to trust fund hipsters, many of them speaking foreign languages. They weren't so different from their counterparts downstairs other than not looking like they were undergoing an ordeal. I ordered beers from the dour bartender. It was not quite noon. When I returned to our table and handed Jeff a bottle, he raised it for another toast. Running into you was serendipitous, he said. You were there at the beginning. You have to keep reading if you want to find out what happens next. So, yeah, he tells this story of, um, Jeff essentially tells the story of, uh, he had a girlfriend in that film class and uh, they ended up splitting up just right after college and he was completely heartbroken and so he was down um, at the beach watching the sunrise because he couldn't sleep one morning and uh, saw an ocean swimmer trying to make his way to the shore and then stop moving and he pulled him from the water and gave him uh, CPR that he only knew from watching on TV, but he managed to revive the guy. And then the paramedics came, or the lifeguards, then the paramedics took the guy away, and then Jeff was left alone with a you know, wool blanket on the beach, wondering what had just happened. And um, as Vu mentioned, he, he then found his way into, into the guy's life. So the guy he saved was an art dealer. And I'm skipping way ahead into the book, um, Jeff has come to work for this art dealer now. And the art dealer does not know Jeff is the guy who saved his life. Um, and this is Jeff coming into his own, I guess, uh, at Sotheby's in Beverly Hills. The auction house's imposing front desk was manned by staffers in their 20s wearing black suits. They knew Francis by sight. He and Jeff walked straight, in, straight to the offices. The large space had a surprisingly low ceiling. People tapped away in cubicles, while beyond, others stood at a long table, perusing what looked to be layouts for catalogs. Francis found who he was looking for, a 30-something woman with a glimmer of the hunt in her eye, someone who enjoyed a good battle, Jeff sensed, and they made their way into a gallery where works were being hung for a preview event in a week's time. Francis didn't introduce anyone to Jeff, nor did anyone acknowledge him other than with a perfunctory, closed-mouthed smile. Through the doorway, Jeff noticed a man making his way down the length of the offices, led by a senior Sotheby's employee in a neat black suit. It took him a moment to realize who the figure was. Francis recognized him at the same moment, told Jeff to wait there, and marched across the offices, arm outstretched to shake hands with Mick Jagger. The woman followed Francis, and Jeff was left alone in the small gallery, filled with a variety of paintings, some still wrapped, some hanging, some leaning against the wall. He found himself yet again searching for something in the work to stimulate something inside him. I or no I, he should have an opinion about these pieces, shouldn't he? He found the painting by Francis's artist, a thickly impastoed palette knife production in dark tones that could have just as easily been a patch of dirt in a field somewhere or a compost pile. The estimate had not yet been posted. A large painting across the room caught his eye, leaning against the wall, a diptych. He was drawn in not only by its monumental scale, but also by its complexity, its energy, its dynamics, and its seemingly unresolved and unresolvable nature. He didn't look at it so much as watch it. He let his eyes move across the surface, taking in the strokes of dark brown, blue, yellow, orange, lavender and white. The blobs, the drips, the forceful gestures, the accidents, the way the seam between the two panels bisected the floating cloud or blob or explosion so that it looked as if the left side and the right side were painted at different times from different vantage points, the lines not quite connecting, the right side magnified and shifted up a foot. The canvas's 
almost connected, and in distribution of color and gesture, the overall image was almost symmetrical. So that if he thought about it, which he did, um, not until later, much later, part of the painting's overall dynamic mimicked what happens when our eyes cross or are affected by different lenses or in some way uncoupled from each other. Double vision, a parallax view, an image refusing to resolve into a single perspective. He would look back on this moment many times and feel the same fluttering in his chest he felt upon first encountering this work. And no matter how he tried to reduce his response to logic or reason, he would always fail. Only after he'd stood there for who knew how long did he think to read the label to find out who had made the painting. Joan Mitchell, painted in 1986. Both the plainness of the name and the recent date didn't fit for him the idea of artistic genius, which was, he had been taught, always foreign and always old. The estimate seemed too low for such a profound work, at least compared to the numbers he'd come into contact while working at FAFA. Though when he thought about it in the context of real world funds, the low estimate comprised 10 years of his earnings. And yet even while that seemed ridiculous, it still seemed to him too low. In the distance between these values, he felt himself recalibrating. And in the field of energy created by the painting, he felt intimations of an eye of his own. Francis entered the gallery, vibrating with energy after his encounter with Mick Jagger. He sidled up next to Jeff, who hadn't taken his eyes off the painting. Woof, Francis said. That's a perfect response. Woof. Yeah, he didn't like the painting. Second generation abstract expressionist. He's very dismissive. I had a boss who had that reaction to Joan Mitchell back in the 90s. A, after boss, a, a boss in, 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 in an the art, art world. An art appraiser, yeah, that I was working for in the 90s. And, um, and I freaking loved Joan Mitchell's paintings. I, I just uh, stumbled across them because she, uh, an artist whose estate we were doing had... Uh, a Joan Mitchell mm. in in his collection, and I was like, "Who is like? What is there's something about this this work?" Yeah. And um, so I got very excited and told my boss, "Like this is amazing." And she, and she said, uh, she didn't say "woof," but she said, "Yeah, second generation abstract expressionist." <laughs> but I feel like Joan Mitchell's come into her, her. I mean, she's dead, but her work has finally come into some recognition in in recent years. Well, well let's talk about that. I was, sure. I was going to start elsewhere, but let's talk about you can art start because I, I I feel like. You know, you have this wonderful premise that I've, I've you know, uh, we've already articulated and you've read some of it. And, um, and you know, the man that Jeff saves is a famous art dealer. Yeah. Uh, and the rest, the rest of the plot seems to hinge on all these, you know, questions about destiny and agency and, I don't know, is there a stable moral meaning in our decisions to hurt people or, or help people, right? And so I wonder why you then chose the art world and an art dealer as the, the, the environment to, for these questions to play out for, for your, you know, Jeff Cook for this. Yeah, um, I, because I hate research and uh, <laughs> I used to work in that world. I, you know, it's interesting you asked that question because when I, like in earlier drafts, as I was trying to sort this book out, I, you know, at some point came across the, the you know, came up with the idea that Jeff saved somebody who was somewhat, you know, toxic, I guess you could say. Yeah. And I was like, well, what does this guy do? And he was like working, he was like working, in, he had a consulting company that would downsize companies kind of thing in this big office tower. And I just thought, oh, so not interesting. Uh, I mean, you know, it's a sort of like, a sort of uh, cliche villain of uh, modern times. And then I've always wanted to write uh, a something set in the art world, and, um, and I thought, am I, if I make this guy one of these mega dealers, uh, am I just being lazy? You know, am I just doing it because I wanna? And, and I had to get over a hump. Um, and then now, it's, now it that the book perfect. is, it's self-evident, right. Like, it feels but, perfect, yeah, but conceptually. For those of, right, for those of you, though, thinking about process, uh, sometimes you have to just 
like take the leap, even if you're really feeling like, well, I don't know if this is going to fit everything. And then it really, yeah, the, the whole um, question of sort of uh, sliding value on multiple levels works yeah. there. And, the, and, the, and this idea of like self, um, uh, self-fashioning, self-creation um, really comes into play. And but, it, but the easy way out is, is not always easy, right? I mean, it's like just because you knew the world that doesn't yeah. mean that it just came to you all these decisions right. about, uh, about Francis, about, uh, you know, about you know, the world that you depict on the page, right? Yeah, no, but it was sure fun to write about. Yeah. I mean, when it, the, 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 the little details were fun to include. Uh, the Mick Jagger moment was mm. directly from life. That really? was, you know, I was backstage at Sotheby's holding some painting that we needed to have, uh-huh. and Mick Jagger comes walking through, you know, <laughs> and there's a moment where Jeff meets um, Agnes Martin yeah. uh, in a gallery at Pace Wildenstein, and she shakes his hand and stares into his eyes in this really intense way, and he's like, does she see something in me? Because she's this very sort of mystical slash schizophrenic artist, and, um, and she holds his hand a bit too long, you know, and he's like, I think... And, and the narrator's like, well, do you think so? And he's like, I don't know, but, you know, maybe. That happened to me. Uh, well, that act, same uh, thing happened to me, and I still wonder, did, uh, but, did, but, did Agnes Martin see something, a fellow traveler in the world of art? But I, I want to push at this a little bit, because I, I, too, I've never been part of the art world, but, like, oh, since COVID, I started watching a lot of YouTube and ended up watching hmm. tons of, like, art, you know, just videos on art. So it really got me interested in art history again, but especially got me interested, anytime I get obsessed with something, yeah. I get obsessed about the world itself. Yeah. So I got really interested in the contemporary art world, not just, and, and as a writer, I'm sure you think about this, as a writer you compare not just the differences between our processes, right? The process of a, a writer versus the process of a visual artist, but also the, the, the huge gap between our worlds. Yeah. Right? You mean in terms of the kind of art that we make? Well, just the world that we, we traverse. I mean, it's a, it seems to me, I mean, there's privilege and then there's privilege. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? So uh, I want to ask you, and this is also overlaps, you know, you recommended that profile in The New Yorker on, is it Gagosian? Yeah, Larry Gagosian. I mean, I read it. It was just so fascinating. I yeah, mean, it's it, an amazing... Can you talk about that and how he... This, the overlap with that character and Francis, but also what else about the art world is fascinating to you and lended itself to, to this premise? Right. Well, yeah, so Patrick Radden Keefe, who's a tremendous uh, fantastic non- writer. fiction writer, yeah. fantastic writer, wrote a profile of Larry Gagosian in The New Yorker about a month ago or so, and I was excited to read it. And, um, and, and as I read it, I just was sort of like, felt very validated in this character that I created because there's a lot of overlap that, yeah. that was um, maybe some of it was just sort of intuited by me or I'd picked it up in the, in the gossip sphere back in the, in the 90s and absorbed it. But I was like, well, okay, yeah, these guys are uh, cut from the same cloth. But, um, I, you know, the, the sort of, the, I, I've always been fascinated by the values and the, uh, the value placed on artwork financially, like yeah. just in terms of, of money. My experience was I was not an art history major. I was an English major. I was pre-med. I came out of undergrad looking for a job, and, and, I, and it was a, uh, my, my boss was a fine art and rare book appraiser. Now, anybody coming out of undergrad who wants to be a novelist, which I decided at that point, might go to New York and, uh, you know, intern at a magazine or go somewhere like that. But I just saw the word book, you know, in a job listing, and I was like, books. I want want to do books. So, book appraisal, right. And so, it was like 3% of the job was books, and all of it was art. And um, so, I had, like, everything I came to know about contemporary art, I got on the job. Wow. And, and a lot of that was, you know, like estate work or whatever. But I would read the catalogs. I would read the, the, you know, introductions that were written in these catalogs. And so everything also had a price tag on it, which I was really ambivalent about, as you can imagine. But like the first time after starting that job that I went to like Paris and I went to the Pompidou, I walk in there and I'm like, okay, you know, there's Franz Klein, Clifford Still, whoever, right? And I, but I know all the, suddenly I know all the artists and I have some sense of who they were and like what they've done and how much each of these things should be insured for, which was just 
weird, you know, it's kind of a creepy feeling. But on the other hand, that's kind of, that it's just interesting that these things become worth this much. And I, I went to uh, Freeze uh, in LA a few years ago and I was looking at all the boring art there and I came across this work by uh, Tatsuo Miyajima who I'd seen at like the Whitney a million years before but like had been deeply moved by this one piece. And I was like, oh, he makes little ones. I could get a little one and have a piece of that experience, you know, like that, that sort of acquisitive urge. And I was, it's like this big, and it was $55,000 and I was like, Holy shit, what a bargain. <laughs> I can't freaking believe. I can yeah. walk out of here today with one of those for 55,000. And then I thought, well, 55,000, that's, that's actually a car I cannot afford. Mm. You know, like that's a very big number, but in the context of art world stuff, it's, it's very affordable. And so that, I, I, like, the whole time I worked there, I was trying to calibrate those things, just like Jeff is, and he's ambivalent about these yeah, but did well. you find yourself, and Jeff does this, yeah. it seems to me, that, that you're, you're constantly trying to, to maintain or find um, a kind of stable idea of the worth of, uh, of an artist or a painting in light of this ri ridiculous valuation. Because it seems to me that overlaps with how you, you consider the worth of a person. Because that's how Jeff, that's the kind of, you know... Um, I guess, cognitive dissonance he has, yeah. you know, uh, uh, being new to this world. I mean, did you, like, think to yourself, am I overpraising, or do I see this artist in, in just, you know, too good a light because of what their work, you know, is how their work is valued, uh, monetarily, I mean? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah for sure. I, I, I would look at catalogs and, and be, there are certain artists who, maybe for historical reasons or whatever are, you know, we're selling in the millions instead of the hundreds of thousands. Mm -hmm. And the work of the ones selling in the hundreds of thousands was more interesting to me. But I, I definitely would feel the shine and the vibe of the more expensive work and be influenced by that. But then sure. would you then see the people involved? Not just the artists, but like say, you know, your boss, the, the fact that they're dealing with, with money in this way that they suddenly have value that you would otherwise never see in them? No. No. Not, not so much. I didn't really, well, I didn't really deal with collectors so much. Yeah. Um, or, in, you know, it was like mainly uh, when I, we dealt with a collector, we'd be at their house and looking through their collection, but I'm not sitting down with them uh, talking about, mm -hmm. uh, you know, auction results or anything like that. But there were, yeah, there are definitely people in that world who can make things happen and other people who can't. And it, it's... Interesting too, you can walk in there with your Coinbase millions, yeah. right? Walk into Gagosian or whatever and say, I want this. Even if it's a show with things with, for sale. Oh, I'd like this one. Eh, okay, maybe, you know? I don't know you. I don't know what's gonna happen to this painting when you buy it. Is it just gonna end up in your house? Is it gonna end up in storage? Is it gonna go lend to a museum? You're not part of the culture, you don't have the, so the, the like very rich people can sometimes get very frustrated by not yeah. being looped in. It's just like it's super like high schooly. Well, the uh, profile talked about that. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah it's that, so that... weird. I mean, it's a truly it's a truly strange world, and it's worth what people will pay. Hmm. That's what it comes down to. That's fair market value. You have a willing buyer and a willing seller. Uh, you know, that's what people pay for them, and that's what they're worth. And and. Y then you, you can look at those numbers and say, well, that money could be better used doing X, Y, Z. Well, the person the painting was bought from ha now has that money. Maybe yeah. they're gonna do something with, I don't know. So, is, is, and, and by the way, we, we started at, what, 540? We, we should, you know. We could uh, talk about not, just talk about the art world too. Yeah, yeah. Um, so we'll probably talk about till 640, 645. So if you have questions, just raise your hand and, and interrupt me. Oh, there's um, a question on the end already. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. I, sorry, before the topic moves on to something else, I was thinking about, um, just as you were talking about revisionism, and you know, like the parallel between writing and art, and like painting, and like, the um, man like original sort of uh, uh, like intent of Novels and pieces of writing versus like maybe I don't, I'm not an artist, so I don't know like how much you can revise a painting or a drawing. 
Yeah. And also, I was curious, um, Dizzy Hernandez was talking about like the privilege for me and then the privilege, privilege for me to be yeah. your talk. And so, like, almost like both sides, like, the privilege should be sort of my like, form of cultural capital. And like, oh, yes, I have read this, but this, I got this. And then, like, the privilege, privilege will be to be like, oh, yeah, I have that feeling. Like, so, <laughs> right, yeah. so, like, it's sort of like the different levels of that. Response has many years few aspects of that question as you, or like, whatever interests you about that question. Yeah. Well, starting with the cultural capital question, I've I've read that. Yes, I've you know I've read Proust, uh, you know, or whatever it is. I, people that exists in the art world too, right? Are you familiar with Hot Artist X, or are you familiar with this this show or this work? There, there's always people trying to keep up uh, with the Joneses. Um, they, you know, when it comes to visual art, visual art is um, you know distinct from um, novels in the sense that. Uh, at least for individual works, they're they're not reproduced cheaply, right? Uh, you can you you just got this one painting, and they're experienced um, in a different way. Like narrative uh, works, we have you have to experience it in order, right? You can't just shuffle the words in a book and read it out of order. It's this time-based thing, and when you spend time with a painting, you're maybe taking the whole thing in, but you can you're taking there's no beginning and end. Right, You're, it's just a, a boom. So, it's a it's a very different um, uh, aesthetic experience, and I, I think in terms of collecting the art is where a lot of people start to have is take issue with the art world because um, uh, those of us who uh, have maybe aesthetic inclinations, we want to be able to experience art. We we want to go to a museum and look at these. Sometimes you. I've been to the Museum of Modern Art in, in New York, and I was cranky and low blood sugar, and I walked through the whole place, and I'm just like, <sighs> all this art, check, 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 you know, and I just was really cranky, and I came around the corner, and I saw the big Jackson Pollock. And Jackson Pollock had never spoken to me before, you know, I just had seen the okay, whatever, and I was just like, almost like a synesthesia thing, and I'm not a synesthesia guy, but just like, <sighs> and I just sat down, and I was like, Fuck, you know, this is just undeniable. This is, this is an, an incredible aesthetic experience. So why should that be in somebody's house, right? And become a token of uh, wealth, like a, an asset allocation thing, right? Where people like, well, I've got so much freaking money that like even real estate can't contain it anymore. So I'm going to keep it in a free, you know, buy like a couple $60 million paintings and put them in a free port. Um, and then, you know, like in that whole world of that super, super, super privilege and wealth, those people are competing with each other in terms of, oh, I got this painting and I couldn't get this one and do you want to swap this? In, in the same way that, you know, your kids trade Pokemon cards. It's, it's real, you know, and it's just, it's just, a, it's the same human impulse just on a different scale in terms of the amount of uh, capital being moved around and then capital representing maybe time, you know, that time is money, supposedly. So there, there's a lot more power moving around in that sense, in terms of the people that are involved? Oh, yeah. Sorry, with regards to this, like, semi-allegory of, like, valuing a person versus valuing art, yeah. how do you feel about the value of art increasing after the artist dies? Well, yeah, you got to, uh, all of a sudden, there's no, no more supply, right? And so then things can, can become more valuable. Um, I don't, yeah, I don't know. I, I think that sort of folds into just the idea of um, some of these artists whose work sells for gazillions of dollars um, didn't necessarily benefit from those, those art sales while they were alive. I mean, Van Gogh is the classic example, but there are plenty of artists who, you know, sort of made a living as an artist or had a, you know, uh, cold water loft living situation and they sold their paintings and then only later does their stuff become worth millions and millions and oftentimes after they're, they're dead. So I don't know if I have other thoughts about it other than but I, I, artists tend to, artwork tends to be for the future and it um, makes it hard to live in the present for some artists. I'm glad you, Jojo, asked this question because like I, for me, one of the big questions for Jeff, you know, Jeff Cook in the novel, to just to segue back into to your novel, is the, this idea of, of uh, the, uh, the fluctuating value of art is kind of 
you know, becomes the fluctuating value of, of other human beings, right? It's like he, I feel like his dilemma in the novel is to find some sense of reliability uh, of what, you know, this person means to him. Uh, and, and you kind of use art as a vehicle for that. I mean, you, you, on our first panel, you know, focusing on trouble and art, you, yeah. know, you, you spoke about unreliable narrators which embodies our inability to get at the truth, to see clearly. Yeah. Um, and you were suggesting that basically no narrator is truly reliable. I think when most people refer to unreliable narrators, particularly in fiction, they think of uh, them using the sense of being manipulative and delusional. But, you know, I find that rather incomplete because, you know, a person could be totally um, well-intentioned and sane yeah. and still be unreliable, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, like, how... Do you see Jeff Cook as an unreliable narrator? If so, why? But also, do you see what I mean? Like, yeah. like how he's like striving for some reliable sense of the world around him and what yeah. he experienced. Yeah, and I think you know there are a lot of I've heard a lot of different readings of Jeff. Like people yeah. going from you know he's a psychopath from the start to you know he, my take on him is more that he's a, just a genuine doofus at the beginning and, and stumbles his way into this situation yeah. and is genuinely drawn by curiosity and by something he can't identify in himself is partially this traumatic feeling of the event of this rescue but also there's almost like a cosmic force at work um he's he like fate. well he's seeking out a reward for what he's done mm. and protesting to himself and to our interlocutor the entire time against it but it's, it's like no matter what he says mm. the nature of this relationship is such that that he's drawn to yeah. to to seek some kind of reward, and he you know is constantly kind of uh, denying that. But also in terms of his unreliability, he's looking back on his life and saying, "Here's how I got to where I am today," which I think is a great uh, moment for any of us to kind of elide over anything dark we might have done. And for Jeff, who likes to see himself as a real good guy, um, he sort of doesn't even acknowledge that he was ambitious. Yeah. This guy came straight up the glass escalator um, and doesn't acknowledge his own privilege and doesn't acknowledge his own ambition. And, and the story he tells is almost like he's sort of, oh, then this happened and then I bumbled into here and then I, you know. Well, you, you describe him as a, a, a doofus a, stumbling into yeah. it. Yeah. But he really, really believes it. Yeah. Yeah. So that's... To an extreme degree. Yeah. And... and there are cracks in that belief, yeah. uh, especially toward the end of the book. You can see ways in which he's actually manipulating his own story. But, yeah, I think, I think he believes... I mean, the narrator kind of wonders whether he believes or not. It's an open question. Uh, that's the fun thing about this book, for me at least, is I have this narrator that's listening to Jeff. So if you ask me, does Jeff believe this? I say, I don't know. It's Jeff. All I have is what Jeff told the narrator. So... Um, it, there's like all, there's, I feel like more and more I want to make work that allows, that's open work that allow you know, without, yeah, be, yeah, without yeah. being like inviting uh, speculation, but you want to invite interpretation, not speculation, but like, uh, like work that, is, that, that allows different readings to sort of coexist side by side. But then if we work on this premise of, of things being unreliable, narrators being yeah. unreliable inherently, yeah. well, what does reliability look like to you then? Do you, do you even know? No. Yeah. I don't know. That's, that's scary. I only yeah. know it as a negative, I guess, right? Yeah. Hmm. Or just inherently subjective. Yeah, yeah. So we have a question uh, over there. Getting into, you talked about experiences in the art world and how this is from the book, and I think that's really interesting to write about like, what we know and how we transform it. I'm just kind of curious, how you approach fictionalizing your experiences, like what you take from your life versus like what you quickly add to it, or like how you change character actions compared to what you do. Yeah. Well, for this book, a lot of what I took was the physical world of the of the art world in Beverly Hills in the '90s, and in fact, the go, the gallery. FAFA, the gallery that is described in this book, is essentially like exists in place of where Gagosian is. Oh, now. really? Yeah. Even though it's mentioned in the book that Gagosian also exists, you know, mm. fictionally, that's kind of what I described and, and where it was. Um, and then in terms of, there, there are, yeah, there are encounters um, and little bits and pieces, but they're kind of, uh, 
it, they're woven in, but they're kind of like anecdotes. They're not necessarily things that are deeply, you know, meaningful or personal to me. Um, it's just kind of a way of uh, creating the milieu and, and that sort of thing. And I, I talked about this in the, in the craft lunch a little bit. Um, there's a classic Philip Roth quote. I think it's classic uh, from the anatomy lesson where Zuckerman talks about in writing, you have to use some of the personal ingredient for the writing to be any good, but too much of the personal ingredient and you disappear right up your own asshole. <laughs> and and it's, it's just an interesting uh, point because you can't sort of not bring your, some, some piece of yourself to what you're working on, but it's sometimes if you bring too much, um, you can end up very confused. And for me, I, I just did that recently with another project that I was alternating with this one. And um, I can't believe I fell for for that mm. trap after t teaching the, the that quote for 20 years. <laughs> I think uh, Ashna and then someone in the back there. Okay. Um, I recently read Stephen King's on writing, which advocated for writing as a kind of prolific art, where he poses the question as a writer, do you not spend your time pumping out work? Then what are you doing with your time? And I'm wondering what your thoughts are on the ebb and flow of the writing that's an excellent question, um, especially because I feel like I'm in a slight period of transition right now. My, my approach has uh, always been to, um, when, when possible, just have, um, look, find myself at the desk every day. Uh, not on weekends because family stuff, but I always felt like, okay, there's inspiration. When you're feeling inspired, you just want to bust it out. And then be below that, there's discipline. Like when you feel like, okay, I can crank. I don't feel inspired, but I can get this down. And then below that, I think is the most important level, which is habit. And, and even when you don't feel like it and you don't feel like you can do it, I think Joyce Carol Oates call, uh, said, when, you're, when your soul feels as thin as a playing card, um, something I also read early on in my life and didn't understand and now I completely get, uh, you got to fall back on habit. So it, it helps if, you're, if, you, if your schedule allows it to say, well, I like to work in the mornings or afternoon, whenever it is, I'll carve out this period of time. Um, and it's not really about word count. It's about di diving in there and making, making a mark um, on the page. Something I learned after having kids is that 45 minutes is actually quite a long time. <laughs> And um, so I had a friend and back and we were both strapped for time a lot of the time, but we'd write back and forth like text and be like, yeah, I dropped like 245s today or 345s. <laughs> you know, it's sort of, so it's like whatever you, however you want to do it. Uh, the thing that I'm shifting into right now is I, I, I made a big push on something that I don't know how to keep going or I need, it's not right. So I'm not sure if it's, it's throwing it away or setting it aside, and I don't quite know what's next. So I'm trying to figure out, I, I don't want to stop writing, so I'm writing like a page a day, just a handwritten page, just to, you know. But I'm also spending a lot more time reading. So I think it's really important to spend a lot of time reading as a, as a generative thing and as a way to stay connected to what books can do. Uh, yeah, yeah. Can I just ask that? Would that be okay? Um, I, I would say, that CBT might not be the best model <laughs> because um, he has the luxury now of time to be prolific. But also, I think to quote um, the quote of Robert Schiff and talking about uh, <laughs> uh, the need to write every day, that you can give yourself permission not to, and that it's okay. That there's a lot of, I think, and I think you guys must feel it as novelists, there's a lot of pressure to produce, mm -hmm. and yet. Um, Sometimes maybe you don't want to, but you have to read or walk and think, you know, things like that. Just as another model, you know, because, um, and plus you can't produce as much as Stephen King. So let's, let him take on that verb in some ways. Yeah. I like hearing the fact you're talking about pivoting to, to quite a bit of reading. Yeah, and, and you take somebody like, um, Kazuo Ishiguro, right? If, if you can take him at his word, which you can't, because any time a writer talks about their processor, and it's a complete lie, but they're trying, right? It's talk about unreliable narrator, but he talks about when, you know, assembling kind of a novel and the things he wants to explore and whatever, that guy has a lot 
in his head before he sits down to write. And then, so that's his process. So he's not going to be sitting down and writing every day, necessarily. He'll probably do some reading, maybe take a note here and there, but he's kind of, duh, 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 duh. and then when he sits down to write, he's like, okay, I know what this book is, at least up to a point. Whereas uh, someone like myself, I really struggle to make things happen up here that aren't cliche or vague or whatever. I have to lay stuff down and be in a kind of dialogue with what's um, what I'm putting down on the page in order to think my way there. More like um, Don DeLillo, who says writing is concentrated thinking. You know? So it depends on your relationship to the page. There's no one way to do it, um, but there's a sort of general dedication. I want to get to Addy here. At just a second, and, but on the back, and then, and then Addy. Oh, okay. Yes, please. Uh, yeah, you've had your hand uh, up for a while. Sort of on the topic of name dropping, um, I noticed that there's that interaction in the, the excerpt that you read where the narrator is to introduce himself and then he gets cut off by Jeff in this sort of like dropping of, you don't get to hear the narrator's name, at least not in that part. I wonder what you, I, I, I just wanted to ask you to speak a little bit on like the power of that anonymity and how like, that to yeah. That kind of yeah. I mean, I went back and forth quite a bit on that moment. Um, the unnamed narrators get a bad rap uh, <laughs> for some reason, and I, I kind of love a good unnamed authorial stand-in narrator. And uh, initially, I, th I, I did write a draft of that moment where his name is Etienne Watkins. Um, <laughs> what? What? Etienne Watkins. You know this. For Anglo, Franglo, kind of Antoine Wilson name, and uh, and then I was like, no, and then uh, and then I thought, well, what if I just put my name, you know, Antoine Wilson, and then I'm like, ugh, it just clangs, you know, it's going to throw somebody out of the book, probably, um, you know, because if you're not playing with it explicitly, then it's just sort of this weird spike sticking out. So I decided to keep my narrator nameless, um, but maybe I find that people who have finished the book will say, I'm pretty sure he has a name. He said his name, you know, so maybe there's a little sleight of hand in there. But I'm all for nameless narrators. I feel good. How did you... Um, when you started creating that book, did you realize that any books, like, inspired your book? Ah, did books inspire this book? Well, structurally, Initially, as I was working, I had Jeff telling his story in the first person to the reader. Um, and I couldn't figure out how to make it work. Uh, I kept abandoning that book, this book, and then going to a different book, and then abandoning that one, and then coming back. Not like, hey, I'm going to work on two things at once and switch back and forth, but no more like, but why, this what, thing doesn't... Why, 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 does it, why didn't it work, though, uh, just as a first-person narrator? <sighs> I don't know. Yeah. I mean, part, part of it was that I, Je I didn't like Jeff's language right up in the face of the reader, uh -huh. whatever. But, um, but the other thing was, it didn't ever, and that draft is one and a half times as longer than this novel. So, like 75,000. Yeah. yeah, and so it never became a novel for me. It never had that, whatever the line of inquiry, as Chang Rayleigh said the other day, um, was, it wasn't clear, it, and it, it sort of was a story that was going on and on, but with things and themes, but mm, I didn't know why. So I, at the time, while I was working on the other abandoned book, I reread Austerlitz by W.G. Sebald, mm. um, and he's the master of the unnamed narrator, authorial stand-in kind of guy, and in, in Austerlitz, he conveys the story of Jacques Austerlitz, who he encounters over many years and he tells the story. Jack Austerlitz was like a guy who was put on the kinder transport um, during uh, you know, World War II to save him from the Nazis basically and it, he's dealing with a trauma as an adult so on and so forth. So my book has nothing to do with that but reading Austerlitz again reminded me that the, that was a possibility structurally and so then I was like okay I have always wanted to do this name over the PA thing. And I know, I know. In fact, after this book was done and cooked, I was going through my files on my computer and I found airportstory.doc. And I opened it and I was like, what's this? And it was like, 
the name called over the intercom, a distinctive name, but not that. And do, <laughs> it, could it be the person that I knew back in the day? Da, da, da. And then at the bottom, this is, so that's funny, right? That these things swirl around. At the bottom, it said, what about the fireworks from above? And it, this document was dated July 2001. Wow. So, you know, this, this sort of, the, for some reason, those two images were welded together in my brain for 20 years. Yeah. Anyway, so I, I was like, well, I know where to start. And then once I got rolling, suddenly there's just a vibe check, you know? And I was like, this, mm. this seems like it might work. And then as I moved forward, I was like, okay, I see the sort of subject of the book, subject of the book has to do with their conversation and Jeff's act of storytelling, Jeff, Jeff's unreliable narration being up on the stage. Like you're sitting Got in the it. audience yeah. watching the two of them talk in a way, rather than having Jeff talk right at you. Why one is better than the other for me, I can't say, but mm. I, you know, it's just an intuitive thing. Maybe one more question? Yes. So, I was like equally obsessed with like painting and like movies and music as I am with writing. And uh, it's, it's really, uh, I'm, in, I'm super interested in what you have to say uh, about Agnes Martin, because she's a painter like, I was super obsessed with. And also, like, sometimes I like, fall into despair thinking, like, looking at Agnes Martin or someone as great as her, thinking, like, I think the wrong thing, because I think the painting experience is just so sublime and inexplicable. Mm -hmm. And you think, like, do you believe that writing is, like, capable of that kind of Agnes Martin experience? Oh, what a great, a great question. question. Yeah, That's yeah. A good question. Well, Agnes, have you uh, read Agnes Martin's writings? Yeah, she's, there's a, if you Google it, it's just called Writings, Agnes Martin. And see, there are all sorts of expensive paperback copies and whatever, but try to track some of the down the essays. They're very strange, very intense um, works, sort of like her paintings. Um, there's something so about writing fiction and writing novels especially, there's something uh, gritty and democratic and messy, uh, typically about novels that you won't see on an Agnes Martin canvas, um, because the novel is is kind of like it, it's it's meant to be full of full of life in a way that um, I think it, it's it's difficult to order things in that to that degree. Um, maybe in poetry you can you can get away with some more of it, especially poetry that the way that it organizes itself on a page. Um, so, but can can novels achieve that sublimity? Well, I, I have to say I don't know if you've made a lot of paintings, but I think making paintings doesn't feel sublime a lot of the time, and writing novels doesn't feel sublime a lot of the time. Uh, you know what I mean? But and there are certain novels that. Um, it can feel totally sublime in the reading, but if you, if, if you stop, this is something, Wind Up Bird Chronicle by Haruki Murakami is my example of a novel that feels sublime in the reading, but also is, has really sort of jangly prose style and digressions and who knows what's in this thing. It's a grab bag um, to some degree. But one thing I love to do when I'm feeling crappy about my own writing and I'm like, God, I'm, this is not gonna be a book, what am I, blah, blah, blah. I just go to a bookshelf and I pull down like a random book, usually something that I love, which is why it's already on the shelf, open it to the middle, and I'm like, oh, right. This is just made of sentences that I could have written, right? And that's the thing about novels. They, after you've read them, they occupy magical places in your mind, the things that they made you feel, the, the sublimity of the experience of reading them. But if you open a novel, it's just a bunch of sentences that you could have written. So the making, I don't know if you get to participate in the sublimity of your own work, right? You, you participate in the sublimity of reading. I can't, I'm like the one person on the planet who can't actually read this book as a reader, unless I get some sort of brain injury, <laughs> <laughs> right? So I can't have that experience. Um, I have the experience of making it, which is completely different. Uh, so big, I hope that's useful to you. Maybe we should end on no brain injuries. No brain right? injuries. Yeah. We can agree on that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but thank you, Antoine. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um,